If I could retitle this sermon, I might have called it hashtag struggles, because uh, we all go through various trials and various struggles and various things, and so I'm inviting you to put aside the familiar, that place that we always say, oh, I know this story, and say, okay, Lord, teach me something new. In fact, we're going to pray. I'm going to invite you to um, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and teach you something that you never would have thought about this morning. Let's pray. God, we enter your presence. We um, are really just entering into a place where you have already been present before us. And we ask now, God, that this very, very familiar story become new again to us. I talked to some people before the sermon and they said they love this story. It's their favorite story in the Bible. God, help us move to that place of really understanding why this story is here. God, move us in your spirit to hear from you today, to get real about our struggles and the things that we deal with. God, meet us in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And whether you're going through a trial right now, or whether you're facing a trial coming up in the future, or you've come through a trial, you know what we're talking about today. If you've faced difficult things before, uh, you know where we're headed in the scriptures. Maybe you face something medical and you've overcome cancer or you've overcome some very serious medical uh, issue or you're in the midst of a medical situation. Or maybe you're in an age demographic where this time of life is the hardest you've ever experienced. Maybe at work there is a situation where out of your circumstances or beyond your control there's something going on and it's determining or changing the way work is. You're facing a trial. We're all facing various trials and sometimes they're very deep and very hard and they linger forever. Some people face things that we just won't get through and others are just facing bad days. Sort of like this guy, this trash collector having a bad day. Watch this guy. Christian life to be hard. 
Well, this sermon is about how we face that and how difficult things can be, yet God is with us. In fact, on your blank, if you want to fill in some things on your program, you can fill in a couple blanks. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. My dad always said, well, you're going through a hard time now, but you'll be grateful once you get through it. You'll learn more. You'll be able to be a person that's trusted. Do you know, there are people that don't go through trials and don't want to face the hard things, and then you wonder if you can ever really trust them. Has it really ever been hard for them? Have they ever grown and has it been difficult? Can they help me in my given situation? I want to talk to you a little bit about the book of Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar was the worst king of that time. And what he did was he captured the people of Judah. And he brought them, Jerusalem, he brought them into his kingdom. And what he did was he wanted the best and the brightest to rise up and uh, work for him, be part of what he did. So you know the story, if you've read it, and if you've been here the last few weeks, we've talked about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these four that were brought in, and the king advised them to change their clothing, to change their names, and change their language, and their food intake, and all this stuff, and be the king's uh, right-hand people. And they, what they did was they told the king, they said, uh, if we can eat our own food or try something, you'll see that under our uh, God, we'll, we listen to another God, and he will provide for us in other ways. We'll become stronger, and we'll actually be uh, more healthy people than if we eat your food. So the king let them do it, and they actually did, and they were strong in this and that, and they faced different trials. These guys were teenagers, if you will, 20-somethings. And they're facing uh, this king who was actually quite bad in the land. He would capture people and do things and turn uh, the country into his own, taking over parts of land. And what he did, he was so narcissistic, like uh, some of us, I guess. He built this 90-foot tall statue. Do you know how tall 90 feet is? Some of you architects in here, some of you engineers, you know what 90 feet is. I figured this... Balcony is about 15 feet, and this ceiling is about 30 feet. So three times this building is the height of a statue. It's a very tall statue. And in that day and age, they didn't have sky-rise buildings and all that kind of stuff. So any, any view in the land, you would see this statue sticking up. It would be the tallest structure in the entire land. And so King Nebuchadnezzar built this humongous, tall statue. We're in Daniel chapter 3. And then what he does is he's going to have a dedication ceremony. So like any good official, they make everybody come to the ceremony. And they say, this king, he says, everybody will bow down to this statue. And uh, we're all going to be on equal footing. We're all going to submit to the king and bow down. In fact, the verse, a herald shouts out and says this. When you hear the sound of the horn and the flute and the zither and the lyre and the harp and the pipes and other musical instruments, bow to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Okay, this dude's not messing around. You picture the whole entire land forced to obey. And it occurs to me that God doesn't work like that. Do you know that? God doesn't force you to worship him. God gives you free will, this ability to worship if you choose. And sometimes when we have a place of sin in our life where we want God to be farther away from us, God doesn't force the issue. He is so compassionate and kind, He invites us to that place of worship. But everyone is bowing down except for these three friends of Daniel. They're standing up. Could you imagine the courage it takes when the whole society is doing the same thing and you just stand there and go, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to bow down. You've heard the story before, but picture these three guys standing in this place that says, I am not going to bow down and worship. Again, a faith that is tested is a faith, faith that can be trusted. I don't like hard times as much as any of you like hard times. But in the end, God is testing us so that we might have a trusted faith. That God says, are you going to quit on me? Are you going to walk away? Are you going to just do what everybody else is doing? I invite you to think about your personal situation. What trials are you facing right now? Are you facing a difficult thing at work? 
you facing a difficult deal in parenting, in your marriage, uh, with people that are asking of you something, but you just don't feel like it's the right thing. I want to give you today three qualities of standing in faith outside the box. It's so easy to just do what other people are doing, but these three qualities will help us stand up in faith. Number one is this. Faith obeys God instead of following man. Faith obeys God instead of following man. This is really actually a difficult point. Because when society, when culture asks us to do something that is just normal in the culture, do you ever stand against it and resist it? It's going to be tax season pretty soon. It's pretty easy to sort of fudge on your taxes. Everybody does it. It's pretty easy to go, well, I didn't really make this much here, or uh, actually I donated more than I really did, or oh, here's a number, there's a number. It's easy to slip on that. It's kind of what the culture does, what businesses do sometimes. It's like, well, I'll just sort of fake it here or fudge there and see what happens. And, but do we actually just do the ethical right thing? See, everybody's bowing down, and these three guys are outstanding. It's where the idea comes from. They're outstanding gentlemen. They're standing there saying, I'm not going to bow down and kneel. Listen to the scripture in 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king because he had come and noticed these three guys standing up. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Pretty bold men. Because you know the consequence is being burned alive. I don't know if any of you have faced that consequence before. But uh, these three men knew they would die. But they still told the king, it's not for us to defend ourselves. Do you know that when you stand up for something ethical at work, you don't always have to totally explain yourself. You can say, well, I just, I feel convicted about this. I think this is the right thing to do. There's a person, I was at Chili's on Friday night, and there's a person that is not able to come to our church. He, he and his wife, they go to Chili's four or five days a week, and he's an oil rig guy, and he's helping to start this other rig thing. And he goes, I just can't get there on Sundays, but I couldn't sleep on Thursday night. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, that's too bad. You could take melatonin, or you could try to exercise. Or you could. He goes, no, 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 no. I actually had something on my mind, and I couldn't sleep. I said, well, what is it? He goes, your church is on my mind. I said, what? He goes, I just can't get to your church, but I feel like I think about God and I think about your pastoring and I think about your church all the time. And he's talking to me in the middle of his bar and I'm like, this isn't bar talk. That's pretty funny. And he just said, I feel so convicted. I want to get to your church because I know that's the right thing. And he had this great conviction about him. Just like these guys, they're standing saying, we know it's not the right thing, is to kneel down. They, they didn't have to defend themselves. They didn't have to weigh the pros and the cons. Okay, If we don't bow down this, if we do bow down, then this will happen. They didn't think about all that. They didn't have to post on Facebook and ask for advice. Hey, what do I do? Should I bow down? Do you think this is the right thing? And, you know, I don't have much conviction. Is this better to do? And they didn't have to update any of their, their thoughts. They didn't even have to pray about it. They just immediately obeyed. Have you ever been in that spot where you just immediately obey what God tells you to do and you just, all of a sudden, you're standing out there and you didn't expect to be where you were because you obey God. That's what these guys did. They're standing there and they're obeying. They could have done different ways of rationalizing, you know what I mean? They could have faked it, could have like sort of bowed down, I'm like, well, I'm just tying my shoe. Or uh, maybe I'll bow down just this once, and then God will forgive me, I'll just pray to God and ask God to forgive me, it's really not a big deal, I'll just look like I'm not really being different than the culture, I'll just sort of pretend. We can rationalize our behavior, right? We can go, well, God, I, you know where I stand with you on this issue, but I'm going to do this just because I don't want to feel embarrassed or be ashamed or be pushed out from my business or my work. I can promise you this. This is a guarantee. If you stand up for the Lord in something in your life, you can guarantee that Satan is going to give you an opportunity to compromise it. You can guarantee if you stand up for something strong, the enemy is going to find a way for you to compromise. 
It's just the nature of it. It's just the way that it works. In fact, that's how it's worked all throughout biblical history. Adam and Eve were given this opportunity to obey, and they found a way to rationalize it, and they walked away. Cain and Abel, he was given an opportunity to obey and worship God, and he found another way to compromise and walk away. Every single character in Scripture is given this opportunity to obey God and to honor Him and walk, and they can also be given the opportunity to compromise. Again, I don't know what your personal life situation is. I don't know what things are like in school or at work or in your marriage or in your neighborhood or wherever you are. I don't know. But God knows that the enemy wants you to compromise. And so do we stand strong with him and seek what the Lord wants? I love the fact that when Jesus is tempted in the garden, he doesn't compromise at all. He states scripture. He says, no, I'm not going to bend my knee. I'm not going to jump off of this tower. I'm not going to make bread out of these stones. I worship God. The, the word is the truth. And he crushed the idea of compromise. So these guys are struggling. And it's hard to have faith that obeys rather than following man. Here's number two. I'm going to write this down. Faith believes in spite of what it sees. See, we rationalize because we think we see the outcome. We think we see the obvious place of where to walk. But faith says, no, I'm going to believe in spite of what I see. I love verse 17. Said, they said, if, if we're thrown into this blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. He's, they're, they're like, we don't really care what you do to us. Have you ever said, I don't really care what you do to me. I'm going to obey God. That's a hard thing to say. It's very hard to say that. I don't care. And I don't mean you get to be belligerent to the police officer. You get to do whatever you want to to anybody who's in authority over you. That's not what I'm saying. But in your spirit, you say, I'm going to obey God because I know this is right, even when it's difficult. No matter what I see, I'm able to say I know God is willing and God is able to rescue me from this situation. If some people face a bad medical report. I know of people that just found out that they have a cancer or they have uh, torn ligaments or they have a dislocation. One of my friends at the conference just this past weekend, he finished speaking for the youth minister's deal and then he was FaceTiming one of his son, he's FaceTiming his son, and he was walking down out of the bowling alley, and he missed a step, because he was looking at his phone, and he actually fell down and cracked his kneecap in half. Oh. So I said to him on a text, I was like, hey man, how was your weekend? I'd love to talk to you. I kind of had a rough night last night, and he goes, yeah, me too, and he sent me his text, and his kneecap was broken in half. And I was like, oh, even though I face this medical difficulty. God is willing and able to be with me in it. Even though I'm in a broken relationship or I'm in a place where I don't know where I'm going to be with this friend of mine or this a cousin of mine or this person that I have a difficult conflict with, God is willing and able to meet me in it. Even though I don't know where I'm going to be financially in the next month or how I'm going to make it through this next month, I, I'm not quite sure. God is willing and able to meet me in this place. See, my faith can grow in spite of what I see. It's so easy to take the circumstances of what we see and the evidence of all that and then totally miss that God can meet us in that place. What if God doesn't answer you in your trial? What do you do? I was struck this week at the conference too that we live in sort of a triumphalism church. We live in a place that we say, God will always answer my prayer. God will always be there for me. God will always rescue me. What if he doesn't rescue us? What if he lets us go through a trial? What if he lets the thing fall apart? Do we still trust in the God that is there and with us? There's a legend of Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. And he pulled these pastors together and they had a prayer meeting about the Civil War. And the pastors were praying and asking that God would be on their side. That God would come and rescue them and be on their side and help them to win their side of this Civil War. 
And Abraham Lincoln says to these pastors after the meeting, gentlemen, with all due respect, isn't it smarter that we pray that we be on God's side? Amen. <laughs> Rather than God just be on our side? I think for me, when I go through a trial and I want to stand up against whatever is wrong in, in the community, I say, God, be with me in this situation as I face this thing. And I wonder if it's not smarter to pray, Lord, I want to be on your side. Whatever you want for this situation, help me to put down what I desire. Because I don't walk by sight. I walk by faith. And I say, Lord, let me be on your side. What you are doing and how you are reaching the community and the culture and the people that are different than me. Here's number three, if you want to write this down. Faithful obedience is our responsibility, but the outcome is up to God. It's our responsibility to obey God and to trust God's Spirit. And if God's Spirit teaches us and leads us and draws us into a certain place, obey that and trust that and walk in that. Don't question that. But the outcome is up to God. God may not rescue you in your given place. It is not about the results. It's about trusting in the God that walks with you. Listen to this scripture, verse 18. But even if God doesn't save us, these three say to the king, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you set up. See, here's the thing. It's kind of uh, interesting to read this story and to know the end of the story, right? You can close the book and go, oh, good one. I know that story. They didn't know the end of the story. They were in the trial. They were in the situation. They didn't have the opportunity for the epilogue to be written for the end of the book. They didn't know that this would be an incredible Bible story to give us courage. They were in it. It's pretty easy when you know the end of the story, right? It's easy to bet on who's going to win the Super Bowl when you know the results of the Super Bowl. Like if we were all to bet tomorrow on whoever wins today, that'd be fantastic, right? Not that I'm encouraging betting. But you get the idea. It's easy to say, well, I know the end of the story in this. But with these three, they didn't know the story. They had no idea where this was going. Here's the deal. The king ordered that the furnace... And once he finds that these three are rebellious, he orders the furnace to be raised and heat seven times hotter. You know the story, right? So the guards bring these three to the furnace. What happens? As they're throwing these men in, these guards are consumed with flames and die. It's that hot. It's that hot. And so they're watching these three go in and these soldiers die. But you know what's funny? The king watches the three in response to what they do. Do you know as a side note, the people who persecute you, the people who push you to a certain place, they're watching you to see how you respond. People that know that you're a believer, if you're a believer, the people that know that you stand for Christ, the people that understand that you say you have some kind of faith, they're watching you. In football, in this whole league, there are Christian believers that really stand out for their faith. You know, the famous Tim Tebow, right? And people who watch people of faith they stand back and they fold their arms and they're like, okay, faith boy, let's see what you got when you fail. Let's see what you got when it's hard. Let's see what you got, right? Uh, for me, I'm watching Russell Wilson today. I'm like, okay, faith kid, let's see how strong your faith is. He's got incredibly strong faith as a person. He's speaking about Jesus all the time. He's talking about God everywhere he's going, but it's easy to stand back and go, oh yeah? Where's your faith going to be if you lose? Where is your faith going to be if it's hard? You know, people watch you and me all the time. So here's what happens. The king looks inside the fire and he says this. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, was astonished and he rose in haste and he spoke, saying to his counselors, Wait, 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 wait. Didn't we throw three guys in the fire, bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered the king, Yes. Oh, true. It's, it's true, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And they're not hurt. 
And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I want to say something. I think God reveals His power in many places. But you'll know His real presence best in the fire. You'll know God's presence best when you're going through that difficult thing you could never imagine was so hard. I know a lot of your stories. A lot of you have told me your background and the struggles and the pain you've come through. And God was with you in that. And you say now, later, wow, I didn't think I could ever get through that, but God is with me in this. You're not alone with what you face. You're not alone. You're not alone. The next verse says this. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies or was a hair of their heads singed and their robes were not scorched and there was not even the smell of fire on them. The other day I was singeing some rope. I make these pallets with things and I'm singeing some rope with a candle and just burn. Smell stinks. You know? Then it's on my hands and then I can't get it off my hands so I kind of wiped it on my pants and now my pants stink and you have to wash your hands and then you realize it just goes with you everywhere. Or if you've been with people in a room where they're smoking and then you walk out and you're full of smoke because can you imagine these guys didn't even have that smell on them. It gives me the idea that when God walks you, walks with you in something, we after the fact, it looks as though you're just unscathed. Oh, wow, you came out of that nice and clean. And now after this 10 years of recovery or after understanding your experience through this, it just looks like you're sailing, like it was never a problem for you. Some people go, well, it, I just trusted God. God helped me walk in this. And the reason that maybe it doesn't look like I smell like smoke is because God carried me through this. It's such an amazing picture of the pre-incarnate Jesus, if you will, meeting these three, saying, I'm with you in this trial. I'm with you in your midst. And then the king goes on in verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and, uh, and defied the king's command, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Why do I call this faith outside the box? I think it's because these kids had faith before they were thrown in the fire. They had a faith that was outside the box of, of whatever it is, the circumstances, the situation that they went through. They had a faith that stood strong. What are you going through this week? What is it at home that you're dealing with? Is it unemployment? Is it conflict? Is it addiction? Is it awareness of a situation that you're afraid to confront? Is it a trust factor of God? I, I want to trust you. But I, I don't know how to let go of this situation. I, I want to trust you, but my hands are just so tightly gripped around this situation in my life. If I let go, what's going to happen? What, what's your trial this week? Where is it that the culture or the community or something is offering pressure on you to act a certain way and you go, I need to stand up for my faith stronger than this. I, I don't know your situation. God knows. He's the one speaking to you. And my prayer is that even if you're not victorious, even if you don't make it through the trial, in a successful way, a triumphant American, pull yourself up by your bootstraps way. Even if that doesn't happen, can you still trust in the God that walks with you in it? Can you still trust God? Because in 1 Peter 1 verse 7, it says these trials show that your faith is genuine. Do you have genuine faith? Or do you have fake it faith? Do you have Sunday morning Christian church faith? Do you have... Oh, I just look good with other Christians because I'm supposed to faith. Here's the reason we do this. Why is this story even in the Bible? Is it really about these kids and their trial? And is it about us relating to standing strong and being victorious in the flames of the fire and standing up against the king's verdict? And is it really about that? I don't think so. I think it points to Jesus. I think it's a, a way to say, you know who went through 
a harder trial is Jesus. Do you know that Jesus went through a worse trial and he died? In fact, in his death, he took on our sin. And he was able to say, listen, I'll take your sin from you so that you can have relationship with God. In fact, that's why we come to this table today. When we come to this table, we recognize that Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. This is a symbol of suffering. A symbol of a trial by fire. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. It's broken. It's torn for you. I love you that much. And then in the same way, after the meal, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. New covenant. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you... Remember me until I come again. Do you know Jesus is coming again? Yes. He's coming back. Amen. And the trials that we face, the difficulties that we have now, are merely temporary trials. Yes, they're hard. Yes, they look like flames in a fiery furnace. But God says, I'm with you in it. We're going to pray a prayer together. We do this commonly in our church. And I would ask that you consider these words we say of why we come to this table, why we participate in this bread and cup. It's because the Lord invites us to that common place where we know Him and have a relationship with God and forgiveness. Some of you this morning are not in that place of faith. Some of you haven't given your heart to God and said, God, I want to give my life to you and let, uh, let my life be absorbed in you. I learned this week that uh, that whole thing about asking Jesus to come into your heart is not really in the Bible. It's more like we become the body of Christ. We are invited into a relationship with God because God started it in the first place. It's not about asking Jesus to come and live in your heart. It's a matter of asking God to receive us into his family. It's a whole different way of thinking about it. And so as we come to this table, maybe you haven't given your whole life to God. And this could be your time. You could come to this table this morning and say, Jesus, I come to you for the first time. Please receive me into your family. I give myself fully to you. You can do that while you come forward. Father, as we receive from you this morning, we're reminded that Jesus went through the greatest trial ever. And sacrificed his life for us that we might walk with you. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you that you have given so much that we might draw to you. I pray that in return we give the same. We give of our lives, we give of our conviction, and we give of our obedience to you. That no matter the trial we face, we trust that you are with us. Thank you, God, for forgiving us. Thank you that we are made whole because of Jesus. We ask now that, Father, as we continue in worship, that you meet us here and meet us all through the week, Father, as we recognize our trials. We know that we walk in them so that we might grow in more obedience and faith to you. We pray all this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone said? Amen. You know, I talk to a lot of people, and they tell me they don't go to church anymore. They say, but I'm not like the good people who, who don't compromise, you know? I, I'm not strong enough to stand on my own in faith and go to church as a good person. And I go, well, you'd be welcome in my church. Because none of us are that strong, right? None of us can stand alone on our own. That's why we come to Christ. Why is this story in the Bible? Is it because we're supposed to just be stronger and stand up and fight? No. It's because we say, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. I've compromised enough in the past, and I need your help to help me stand strong. Amen? Amen. So I don't know where you're at, or if you've compromised, or you feel like a failure. Well, welcome to the boat. We all do. And we walk with Christ as he gives us strength. So, we receive today's benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his...
countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen.